saying not working so far. <laughs> Sorry? I'm saying uh, not working so far. Um, it's, it's connected, we've got a green light. Then the refresh, no, no, it'll, it'll refresh the page. Okay. It'll refresh the page. It's connected. We can tell if it's working. YouTube's live, so the YouTube's, the YouTube's linked to work, and I did it at the same time. I'm in Facebook Live with the key ending MD. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's the right key, yeah? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, good morning. We seem quite spread out. So might I invite and encourage you to move in to, towards the middle, please? Um, that way it might make us feel a little bit less daunted by being in the main auditorium. Elaine and I were saying, wouldn't it be nice to be in one of the smaller meeting rooms? Thank you. No. Thank you very much. Good morning. So this session, this session is looking at change for the future. And I think I'll start by saying a big thank you to David Anderson, who is the chief executive of Amgetha Cymru, the National Museum of Wales. And it was actually David's idea to pull together this session which looks at future leadership, future leadership of our sector where our museums start from the premise that they're not neutral. And his quote for this session comes from Archbishop Desmond Tutu who says, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen to side with the oppressor. Ooh. When I first read that, I thought, gosh, now that's really stark. You have chosen to side with the oppressor. Is that really what we are doing? Are we making an active choice? Even two, year, two days ago, when I arrived in Belfast, I was grappling with that question of neutrality. It seemed quite controversial. And the good thing about spending time listening to the debates yesterday and talking with colleagues is that it helped me to find a place for that statement about not being neutral, not being neutral as museums, not being neutral as spaces where ex we are expecting communities of real people to gather. But I am still slightly concerned that we ensure that our museums remain spaces where dialogue and difference can be explored and explained. Otherwise, there's a danger that we are creating either or spaces, and we might be creating echo chambers, which we see happening quite a lot, for instance, on some social media. But the question that we're really wanting to explore in this session is not so much the neutrality itself, but how do we nurture and train and support? How do we create the conditions so that future museum leaders are able to pick up that baton of social injustice and safely and strongly but courageously take that baton forward?
As the director of the CLAW Leadership Programme, I'm actively involved in finding the ways to encourage and engage and to ensure that we put that mantle carrying within our leadership programmes. And I'm joined here this morning to just explore this by Sharon Hill. Sharon, of course, director of the Museums Association, really at the helm of activism, this phase that we have within the sector. Sharon has led the development of the Museum's Changes Lives as an entity, as the new vision and mission for the Museum's Association. She's also led on its workforce development. She's led on the changes to its ethics committee and launching here at this conference, the power to the people um, uh, practice practitioner development um, framework. So quite an active role for museums and for the association. Joining me also is Americo Castilla, director and founder of the Fondation TIPA, and TIPA stands for Theory and Practice of the Arts. Based in Argentina, Americo is the former Secretary of Cultural Heritage of the National Ministry of Culture in Argentina, director, former director of the National Museum of Fine Arts, and he's the academic director of Reimagining the Museum Conference of the Americas. And our last speaker on this subject is Elaine Humangurian, who was introduced to you yesterday as a dissenter. Elaine has an international portfolio, including the Museum of Moving Image in Melbourne, Australia, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, the National Museum of Wales, and she has also previously worked at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and the National Museum of American Indian, of the American Indian in Washington. So we have a panel of writers, thinkers, individuals who are both published and practiced in the business of nurturing next generation leaders. So our question this morning is how do we nurture, prepare, support, and encourage leaders to deliver well in socially engaged practice? Sharon, I think you're gonna kick us off. Thank you, Hilary, and thank you for the invitation to take part in today's session. So we started with a quote from Desmond Tutu, and David, I see your Desmond Tutu quote, and I raise you Eldridge Cleaver, the Black Panther, who said, there is no more neutrality in the world. You either have to be part of the solution or you're going to be part of the problem. I'm Sharon Heal. I'm the director of the Museums Association. I'm the chair of the Museum of Homelessness, and I am an activist. So we were asked to reflect critically on the challenges, and I think the only way to do that is to start with the context. So the good news for those of us that are in the UK is that austerity is over. That's what we were told in the budget statement by our government. Unfortunately, of course, the real picture is very different. The real picture on poverty in the UK doesn't come from our Chancellor, it comes from organisations such as the Child Poverty Action Group. And they say there are four million children living in poverty in the UK. If you find it difficult to visualise four million children living in poverty, think of a classroom. In a classroom of 30, nine children are growing up in poverty. I was absolutely horrified to read that in the ward, in the constituency in London that I live in, in Bethnal Green and Bow, 54% of children grow up in poverty. Over half the children in London, one of the wealthiest cities in the world, in that constituency, grow up in poverty. But austerity is over, according to the Chancellor. It's the same budget that was described by the Resolution Foundation as easing austerity most for people who least need it. So the wealthiest 10% are gonna gain 14 times as much as the poorest 10% out of that budget. We know that here in Ireland and across the UK, there's a, an increasing issue of homelessness. That despite the recovering economy in the Republic, people are slipping through the holes in a non-existent safety net. And we've heard the conversations about what's happening, not just in the UK, 
but throughout Europe. There is a spectre haunting Europe and it's of populism and the rise of the far right and intolerance and division in all of our communities. So that's the problem, this much we know. So what is the solution? I don't think this is the solution. So this is Jeff Bezos, who's the chief executive of Amazon, and he's one of the new breed of what has been described as philanthro-capitalists. I don't think they're gonna bail us out. I don't think they can bail out the system, and I don't think they're gonna bail out the cultural sector. He's pledged $2 billion for education and homelessness, but he gets to dictate how that money is spent, and he gets to dictate who is worthy. According to a report by the Swiss bank UBS, last year billionaires made more money than at any other point in human history. The world's eight richest people have as much wealth as half of humanity. And I think what's striking in this is that the rich are actually spending less on charity and the poor are given a higher percentage of their income. So I don't think philanthropy is the answer, but we don't have to take it lying down. So this group is Sisters Uncut. They protested at the BAFTAs as part of the Me Too and Time's Up campaign against discrimination against women and cuts to services in domestic violence provision. The activists are everywhere and while we don't have to take it lying down, sometimes lying down helps. But it's not always about the big actions. We've heard a lot at this conference about sometimes it's the small actions of activism that can really make a difference. I was really struck recently, I went to see a Celtic football game. Football's not my thing, it was a family thing that I did. Um, and they have um, a group of women supporters who had a campaign uh, and they launched an online petition to highlight period poverty and increase the visibility of women's issues in football. And that led to Celtic becoming the first club in the UK to provide free sanitary products at its stadium. I think that's an amazing example of activism, a small step having a massive impact. I think we need to draw inspiration from beyond our narrow borders. Young people are mobilizing in America against gun ownership and in many countries against the far right and the, um, a, a, and the situation that they find themselves in. Here in Ireland, we saw the results of the abortion referend referendum this year, and we can see from that that change is possible. It's possible to make a difference. But again, it's sometimes about the small actions and the determined campaigners, such as Catherine Corliss, who campaigned to expose the role of the church in the Tuam scandal here in Ireland. You can achieve change. People have argued that events like Tuam are in the past and we can't judge them, but we must judge them. We must judge the past because it's the only way to learn from it. And where, if not in museums, can we make that judgment? I think sometimes in museums we default to collecting as a way of thinking about campaigning and contemporary society. And don't get me wrong, I think these objects should be in a museum. And there was a bit of a tussle between the Museum of London, I think, and, a, and I think the British Museum about who was gonna get to collect them. But it's not just the objects, it's the people and the values and the stories and what we do with those objects that's really critical if we're going to make change. We heard from the directors in conversation this morning about the, the need for values. And that's what we've tried to become at the Museums Association, a values-led organization. Our mission and vision are rooted in our values and the wider context that I've just described. I presume everybody knows our flagship campaign is Museums Change Lives but that was an incredibly important step for us as an organization, and it has to flow through everything that we do. We've, we are a campaigning organization, but it's not been a smooth or even journey. For every two steps forwards, there's often a step backwards. I think our growth in members is an affirmation of the direction that we've taken, but there's been some battles and some challenges and we've had to think hard about what we're doing and whether it's the appropriate thing for us to do. The, the campaign really has influenced everything that we do. 
I went on a leadership course a couple of years ago and uh, was introduced to this idea of the policy screen. So what you should do is if you're thinking about doing something new or innovative or taking a different direction, you should screen it against your existing policies. And we try to do that with our values. So I can easily get my head turned by sometimes funders saying, we really want you to do this or it'd be great if you could work in that way. And I have to step back and discuss with staff and say, is that the right thing for us to do? Does it add up to our values? Does it add up to what we're trying to achieve as an organization? Our values feed into our code of ethics. When we reviewed that a couple of years ago, we put public engagement and public benefit as the first principle of that code. And that was really critical because I know many of you work to the code on a daily basis. And we don't want the code just to be about keeping hold of collections. We want the code, our ethical commitment, as workers in the sector to be about sharing and hearing other people's stories about the collections we hold in trust. So the values are really important, but we also have to recognize as the Museums Association, we're part of the establishment. We're the, one of the oldest associations in the world. So we've had to think consciously, how do we break out of that? How do we do things differently? And the Festival of Change has been one of those changes that we've made to the way that we work. That came out of our Transformers mid-career program and it was a really nice natural evolution facilitated by Hil Hillary and colleagues who worked on that and the Transformers themselves. And we saw some of the output and product of that at the party at the Ulster Museum last night. It was amazing to see that transformation of that traditional space of the museum in the heart of the museum by the participants in the Festival of Change. We know there's a problem in the workforce of the UK cultural sector and in the audiences. They don't represent the diversity of our communities from the point of view of class or ethnicity or disability. And we need to work on that. And people have acknowledged it. And we've, we've said it for a long time. But we realized early on, from the point of view of the Museums Association, is we can't deliver any of our campaigns without people. We can't deliver any change without people. And we need a workforce that's going to take our campaigns and work with us and run with them. And some of that has come, as I said, from our, our mid-career scheme, Transformers. But I think the other really positive development in the sector, which I want the Museums Association to support and nurture, is this real burgeoning of networks that we've seen. So some of those networks have been represented at this conference, the detox network, but there's also LGBTQ networks, disability networks, the Space Invaders Women's Network, the networks for change that we've seen, museums as MOOC, um, and I think it's our job, as well as supporting the individuals, to support those networks, to not prescribe in any way how they operate our work, but just to support them, to hold their work and to showcase their work. And I think that's just as much a part of the professional development of the sector as any of our CPD schemes. The reality is I think that lots of museums are eager for change and to take a more social justice approach to work, such as Glasgow Women's Library or the Museum of Homelessness or National Museums Wales. This type of work is not easy and it's not without challenge, um, but I think it is the work. I was really struck when we did the research interviews for Power to the People that several respondents said, we don't want to talk about participatory practice, we don't want to talk about social inclusion, we just want to talk about the work because this is the work. And I think that's a nice approach to take. I think when museums take a stand, sometimes it can provoke hostility and we need to be ready for that. Hilary McGrady spoke about that this morning. This image is from an exhibition at the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas and the British Council distanced itself from this exhibition because it said it was too political. Ironically, the project was part of a series called Difficult Conversations. If you can't be political in a difficult conversation, I don't know when you can. And it was reflecting on the UK's involvement in the slave trade in the Caribbean. And the response from the community there was that they felt they'd been censored and that it caused damage to relations that were already strained by the Windrush scandal. 
Amanda Coulson, the gallery's director, said there was a general feeling of being silenced and exploited. So this work is not easy. It can be challenging. It will stretch us, but it's worth doing. And I think it's remembering that context and remembering the reasons why we do it and sticking to our values that can really make a difference in how we approach it. It's not just challenging, it can be hugely rewarding. I think we've heard the example of Birmingham Museums and they were one of the winners at the Museums Change Lives Awards last night, opening itself up to local communities and decolonizing its collections in a brave and powerful work led by some really brave and powerful people, getting that outside lens into the institution. I just finally wanted to finish with this slide, which is the cover of a book which is uh, being published soon. It's significant, I think, that it's been published at this moment in time, so that says something about museums and activism. It's significant because it's uncovered a wealth of practice. But it's really interesting when you write a chapter for an academic book. I did the interviews for this two years ago, and it's still not being published, and practice has moved on. What's really significant is I interviewed 18 people, I think, who are working in the sector in the UK, and the majority of themselves refused to call themselves activists in those interviews two years ago. They were kind of the shy activists. They were saying, well, I'm not really an activist. I'm, you know, I don't, I don't wave placards and I don't go on demonstrations and I don't really make real change. When I went back to most of those interviewees more recently, they're proudly calling themselves activists because they've been on that journey. And they've been on that journey with their networks, they've been on that journey with the Museums Association, they've been on that journey with their colleagues and their institutions, and they're making real change in the sector. So I think that together we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sharon. We're going to now pass straight to Americo. And do please start thinking through your questions because we want to make this a really interactive session once the um, speakers have set out a few positions. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's not that usual that uh, European um, convenings invite uh, representatives from Latin America, so thank you, thank you very much uh, for the Museum Association. And uh, I must say that uh, Latin America is living moments of dramatic social urgencies. Exodus, the terrible word which has a, a very dramatic background, Exodus, is the last and impossible resource of impoverished communities menaced by violence and corruption, while extreme right political revival hurries back to the stage, encouraged by fanatic hierarchies we thought buried by their own injustice. I come from a country with a tremendous inequality. I come from Argentina. It has 30% of its population below the line of poverty, and in which the main museums repeat in an elegant way the good manners taught by the elites who built them in late 19th century. These two images represent that origin. To the right, an exceptional Manet bought for the National Museum of Fine Arts in 1914, on the left, an extraordinary pre-Hispanic metal medallion representing the sacred transfiguration of a man into a ferocious felon, expression of unrepressed desire and intimate power found around the same time in the Argentine Andes. The medallion was found by an Argentine archaeologist, Lafone Quevedo, who later became the director of the University Museum of, uh, of Science of La Plata. And now, the late, capital, late capitalist era in which we are now living turns the image of that sacred transfiguration into a ruthless image of the uneven fight between survival 
and greed. A century after those extraordinary purchases and findings, we ask ourselves how museums can perform their mission in this cruel context and which should be their renewed vision. From the TIPA Foundation, which I direct, and having Elaine Gurian and David Anderson within its International Advisory Board, we don't, dis we don't disregard elegance, but neither will we comply with strict good manners. Extreme social inequality doesn't allow us to perform as if we were strolling on a park while we are heavily walking through a minefield. Mixed up times are overflowing with both pain and joy, and the mission of our foundation is extended to all Latin America, a region with a great advantage of a predominant common language, but also with radical cultural differences from the Caribbean to the Andes or from the Amazon jungles to Patagonia deserts. The recent election of a despicable new president of Brazil, even more blunt in his extreme right-wing declarations than the US president, to whom we have been referring much too often these days. I don't want to, I will refer to him as the OCO, the orange comb over. And this tells us that we have, hard, we have hard times ahead. As museum professionals, we aim to bridge differences in our own and specific way by building a rich contact zone of affinity, that of a new concept of museums characterized by their interaction, respect, compassion, and activism, which define the relation between museum professionals who take part of our programs. In a time when even well-intended governments cannot solve social catas catastrophes on their own and financial corporations rule major decisions, the role of social organizations become a significant social resource. We are convinced that museums cannot be neutral and that they must play an active role as institutions equipped by unparalleled material evidences to sustain relevant discourse and multiple and varied interpretations of current issues. When we look at examples of highly visible museums, such as the Vatican Museums, we feel dismayed by its contradictions and lack of compassionate vision, the vision that poor people expect from Christian minds. The treasures of that museum seem to be the obstacle to reflect on solidarity, while the market value of a handful of its jewels could avoid much suffering and afford hope to hundreds of thousands of migrants. Can we qualify palaces such as the Vatican Museum, whatever its beauty, or rather because of the exceptional beauty of his work of art, I say, can we qualify this palace as a museum with the standards this new century seems to require in using that name? Could a contemporary set of minimum museum standards demand as a condition that the material care for the abandoned, migrants, and the poor need to be in some comparable ratio with the economic wealth of their collections? The limiting rules of the accessioning, tradition, power, and other retentive concepts are also in crisis, as we see how marketing strategies make master paintings fly from one continent to the other in search of financial profit. Having in mind the potential and relevant roles that museums may assume. For the last 15 years, we at TIPA have been training museum persons and building a network of affinities among them. Our main initiatives are the Lab of Museum Management, a one semester program to which Latin American professionals from more than 10 countries are attending 
and from which 25 new museum directors were already appointed in the region. The lab builds an opportunity for reflection on why we're doing what we do, and for whom, and in which way. Thinkers and practitioners from Latin America and also from Europe and North America are invited as tutors to share their experiences with a selected cohort of 30 participants from all fields, science, history of art, museums. And our four graduated cohorts start to disseminate and apply a new concept for museums, which, in order to exist, need the community they serve much more than the people need the old-fashioned versions of the elegant museum. Another of our initiatives is the TIP Observatory on Museums in Consonance with the Social Context, a four-month program in which we lead 25 professionals to perform as amateur ethnographers at their locations in search of hard data on poverty, discrimination, environment, and education. Once they draw a map of their social context upon verified data, selected bibliography, focused lectures, and group discussions, we hold meetings between them and qualified social scientists in order to discuss their findings upon the light of current scientific research. Finally, we work together on the design of projects on which museums may perform within their specificity as social activists. We are particularly concerned with small-scale muse small scale museums and pretentious and numerous that may be found in every town gathered around things and findings that the dwellers themselves have sorted out as valuable testimonies of their existence. Most of them feel diminished in relation to large-scale museums as the irrational mandate for the development and accumulation of capital were also to apply to them. We have made our mission to build locally rooted concepts of museums as socially purposeful organizations and identify a suitable language for expressing this role in the specific context of Latin America. Together with the School of Museum Studies at the University of uh, Leicester, Leicester we are planning a joint venture of action research in order to propitiate a model of hyper-contextualized museums that may deal with local issues in a way that is of interest to that community and explore mechanisms that could help other museums to discover their social potential. We may say that small is becoming big and that those museums shall be encouraged knowing that in their local scale, are better fit to accomplish their relevant and effective social mission. Going from small to the embracing, and in order to showcase inventive methodology, innovative ideas, and creative approaches for transformative change in museums, we organized together with AAM, the American Alliance of Museums, a biennial convening Reimagining the Museum Conference of the Americas. The first one was held in Buenos Aires in 2015 with great success, followed by the one at the city of Medellin, Colombia in 2017. The innovation of formats, the promotion of close and participatory relations among the delegates, and a positive, joyful, and transformative spirit make these encounters unique. Currently, we are working for the next edition, which will take place in Oaxaca, Mexico, on November 20 to the 22nd, 2019. We are expecting some 800 attendants and more than 20 countries represented together with the diverse minorities. A final question remains. Why are we here? What do Latin Americans expect from this conference? What do we have in common? We find it important to reduce the distance between our scenarios. 
The more I know about Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland, the more proximate I feel with your people. We should build an intellectual and political strategy without erasing our problems, our conflicts, and the different forms of domination. Our societies demand that we construct a new framework in which social equality stands on top of the mission of welcoming museums. We must choose the experience of individuals instead of the political theologies that call upon action but prevent us from acting. Let us, say, let us stay with the trouble and work within it. In urgent times, many of us are tempted to address trouble in terms of making an imagined future safe, of stopping something from happening that looms in the future, or clearing away the present and the past in order to make futures for coming generations. Staying with the trouble does not require such a relationship to times called the future. In fact, staying with the trouble requires learning to be truly present, not as a vanishing pivot between awful or Edenic past and apocalyptic or salvific futures, but as moral creatures entwined in immediate and finished configuration of places, times, matters, meanings. This is a quote by Donna Haraway, a wonderful writer. This road, to finalize, this road may seem moderate, but it might, it, might be, it might be the most rational and reasonable option in these impious times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, America. Okay, our final speaker is Elaine. Elaine, your thoughts, please. Um, I'm sitting here because I have papers all over. It is my honor to be here. It's my honor to be in the place which decided that museums change lives was an appropriate association moment. And I wish that for all. But what I've taken as my brief is much smaller and more consistent with the work I do. I'm going to think of all of you as my mentees. In fact, some of you really are. I'm going to try and talk about what it means to be a rising leader and what help I can, I hope, give you in that regard. And in the more humble sense, I'm going to try and privilege the notion that all affiliations that you create for yourself are really sustaining. And that they should not be thought of as side work, but in fact they are essential to hold you together because it's very lonely to be a leader and it is especially lonely to be an activist leader. And that loneliness needs to be mitigated in ways that you can control. And the list is known to all of you. You should have intellectual company. And I wander about saying, will you read my paper? Will you talk to me about these ideas? Do you think this is OK? You should have mentors. And by mentors, I mean a very quite formal relationship where the mentee asks and the mentor says yes. And you should choose somebody to be a mentor who is somebody aspirational for you, but not so far away from you that they also aren't going to relive the experience with you and have recent experience. You should have a coach. That doesn't mean formal coach necessarily, but it does mean somebody you can knock around with about who is more experienced than you. That could be your mentor, but it could be a paid official and your institution could help you with that if they're willing to do that. One should understand that when one goes to a, a program like that, and it's my honor to teach in, in the programs in Argentina, that the most important thing is not access to the teacher, but the cohort. 
the cohort is your real stabilizing influence, and in all these committees that Sharon talked about, those are cohorts and they need to be dealt with with great care. I like to say that I n know or knew almost every radical museum person, and that's because we were all young together, there are not so many of us, and we all stayed in touch. Now that's no longer true, but it can be true for you. You should network with seriousness. You should reach out to those who you admire. If you read things that you like, you can write to them. I'm always pleased when people write to me and say, will you look at this quote? Will you look at something? People I don't know, people who are much younger than I am and from far away. But the internet makes it possible to do that and the worst that can happen to you is that they'll say no. But you should start with your friends and family. And so I'll tell you a story. In 1987, I went from the Boston Children's Museum where I had been for 16 years, the Boston Children's Museum, at that time a notorious activist place, innovating of all kinds, run like a, a commune where we had each other's back, and I had an $80,000 budget to become the Deputy Assistant Secretary for all the museums of the Smithsonian, and I had a $120 million budget. And the Smithsonian was mean, and I was unprepared. And I missed my friends, and I didn't know what to do. Now, I was supposed to be really pleased because it was a very prestigious role, and it really does look very good on my resume but it had no heart in it. I was accused of all kinds of things, both legally and not legally, within the first three months I got there. And at the end of a year, I went to a man named Roger Kennedy, who was the director of the National Museum of, the, of American History, but a man who had been a deputy secretary in the United States in foreign affairs. And I said to him, Roger, my heart is broken because I don't recognize myself, and I don't know what to do. And the person who is standing before you is not only an unrecognizable person, but I don't like her very much. And he said, go home. Not necessarily to your parents, but go to the people who knew you beforehand and check in with them so that you can recapture who you are. And it was the best professional advice I ever got. And so from this stage, I'm giving you this as a present, and it is a serious present. And the reason I'm giving it to you is because the biggest thing that you have to interrogate for yourself is your moral core, your personal moral core. And in order to do that, you have to have people who love you, who trust you, and who knew you before you had to, you thought you were losing sight of yourself. Because if museums are going to model good ethics, it follows that the director's conscious access to and application of their personal ethics is key. Directors in museums have sometimes become susceptible to moving their position closer to the elite's view of the world or the public's demand, depending on the source of pressure and its situational power. Making unpopular decisions based on an ethical sense and moral core brings considerable risk to a director's tenure. And I like to say some of my best friends have been fired. The guiding principle for the honorable honorable director must be simply stated this far and no further, drawing the proverbial line in the sand. This far and no further cannot be standardized. But the sentence is perhaps the most controlling one in the world of personal conscience. And that means this far and no further is going to look different in every institution and going to look different for every per person and for this to happen means you have to be willing to be fired and lose your job this far and no further. However, 
my work is to prevent you from having to say this far and no further at work. I think it's a waste if I can't help you prevent being fired, if we haven't looked under the radar for every single political leverage, system, idea, other person, so that you can navigate it so it's consistent with your moral core, and yet under the radar is protective. Though I must say, there are people in this room for which affiliation itself is dangerous, and those who had the privilege to go look at the South African presentation, at the Baltic presentation, and I currently work in Ukraine, will understand that every single one of these above-the-radar decisions is a political decision, even innocuous affiliation. All decisions are political. All decisions are philosophy, every single one. But your network can be helpful, and you're learning all the ways in which politics works can be helpful, and all of that can help be helpful to you if you have access to people who are willing to train you in doing that. And therefore, you don't have to do this alone. I'm going to read you a small list of things I wrote for a group of students who, who are graduate students in San Francisco where their graduate program is about social justice. And they had pooled their money and they could invite one person and they, I was honored to be the person they had chose to invite directly, not through the school itself. So I wrote them this as if I was their grandmother and I'm happy to give you the list. Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House of Representatives during the Reagan presidency, said, all politics is local, to which I would add, all actions are philosophy. Start with a personal inventory that is political, biographical, and emotional. Be very clear about yourself check in with old friends and your quirk and look at your quirky individual strengths and use them as a litmus test for all decision making introverts are useful less drama is useful check in with yourself you have much to offer you don't have to emulate anyone and then actually plot things out align them with your philosophy see what's achievable in your neighborhood, and only a little aspirational. It doesn't have to be dramatic. This is all contagion. Treating your coworkers well becomes the way in which coworkers are treated. The things you do really do matter in these small ways. Assume others are doing good things so you don't need to do everything. Build a network. Be tenacious, though polite. Change is a long-term endeavor. Say no to stuff that violates your core and always be prepared to lose your job. Life comes in chapters. Don't plan too far ahead. The next road that feels right rather than the one that's rationally appropriate may seem boring, redundant, or uninteresting. But all experience, no matter how seemingly tangential, will make sense to someone who is hiring you later, even if it does not make sense to you now. Be a learning junkie. Learn from everyone, from everywhere. Do not judge the value of hierarchy of the source. Have a third eye while doing. I love to teach third eye. Watch what you're doing. Watch what everybody else is doing. See how they're doing it, not only what they're saying. Treat everyone, even annoying people, with respect, civility, delight, and interest. They surprisingly really do have something to offer. Maybe not Trump. <laughs> Remember that written emails, tweets are public and permanent records. Never succumb to written bitchiness, no matter the provocation. 
And here's my act actual current favorite. Criticism is not a public good. Everyone is trying. No one is perfect, and perfection is a destructive goal anyway. Be a constant cheerleader to all around you. Work hard to quash your inner voice if it's prone to jealousy, envy, and comparison. And pat yourself on the back. You are not a fraud. You are doing way better than you think. And find the awful times to be at least instructive and interesting. Remember, optimism is your most important asset. So have a good time whenever possible. Thank you. Wow. What a, what a fantastic list. I, I, I definitely am going to hold on to that one myself. It's very interesting um, listening to all our speakers. The things that have stood out for me are about networks, affiliation, the laboratory, really trying to make sure that you have good intellectual company, mentors, friends, families, those seems to be the things that are coming out in that sense of how do we nurture and support those future um, generations of activisms. It'd be interesting, can we throw the lights up? How many of you within the audience are part of networks, are affiliated, feel that you are part of a chain of support? Just give us a quick show of hands. Great, that's a fantastic percentage. Because what that shows is that advice that we're getting about don't do it by yourself. What did you say? The loneliness of the activist leader. To avoid that loneliness is in itself one of the ways that we can nurture and support. I'm gonna throw it open to questions. Um, is there a microphone? I should have sorted this before. Yeah, there's one in the back. Can we get the lights up? Can we get the lights further up? Okay, please, if you have any questions, there's one just beside you. Thank you. Uh, Piotr Pinkowski, Paul Hamlin Foundation. It was mentioned at the beginning that the, the, the idea of values has been running through uh, most of the sessions, and a lot of it started with Elaine's wonderful words at the beginning of the, the session yesterday. And I feel that what you said then has reverberated, certainly through all the sessions that, uh, that I've been in so far. Um, but I continue to be troubled. Um, yesterday, uh, Elaine, you were saying that we've been doing things wrong. We've been, you said you didn't know anybody who had voted for Trump, and we have to bring in people who uh, we don't know, who we hate, who we fear. Um, and I'm troubled because I wonder how do we align that with our values? And you've just said now, and this is what most troubles me, that when we talk to people, we have to respect them. How do you respect people who you fear and hate? How do you include them in conversations? How do, how do, we, how do we include them in, because we haven't been including them for the last few decades? Thank you. What I'd love to do is to take a couple of questions together just so that we make sure that we get um, the voices in the room. Is there another question? I can't see a hand. Okay, so whilst you're warming up that second question, we'll go to um, a response to that. How do we include those dissenting voices? Thank, thank you for that, because I have left out an important ingredient. There's a distinction I make between the humanity of my enemies and their behavior. And there really is a step now in which normative behavior accepted ways of rhetoric have been destroyed by our current president and his allowing a behavior that is unacceptable and damaging to the other people to happen. And therefore, I think we have to go through a formal process of pre-agreement, sometimes known as um, civility or the articles of civility, that in fact, 
This is not an all-out anarchy about treating human beings without dignity, without acceptance that humanity is in all of us, and without acceptance that there is no winners and losers in debate. There is the hopeful ability to find overlap, for which there has to be, in Yiddish it's called Rachmonis, and Rachmonis means pity if you translate it, but what it really means is that I accept that in front of me is another person, and therefore we can deal with it on that level. So I no longer believe that we can have any debate, uh, um, that we cannot have any interaction without a mutual set of activities in which the rules of engagement are protective of the humanity of all people. And that's a, that's a process behavior rather than a content behavior, but I agree with you totally. It is not a free-for-all. I am not opening the doors to let racists in to shout, Jews will not replace us. That is what happened in um, Charlottesville. That's what the debate of Charlottesville is about, that the president then of the United States said there were good people on both sides. Well, there may have good humanity, but that's not acceptable behavior. So the rules of engagement have to come in now because what was true before, which was normative behavior, is no longer true. And that is we agreed on certain bedrocks of ways in which we all believed in facts, in truth, and in your word was your bond, which we no longer believe. Sharon, do you? Thank yes. you. Um, I, I think I would agree that um, that might be an occasion on which we draw that line in the sand and say this far and no further. And there was definitely discussion about that at the director's uh, in conversation this morning in saying that you know we do take a stand sometimes and we do own the space. So I think in that example you could. But I was really, really struck when we had the referendum on the EU a couple, a couple of years ago now. Uh, I was at a conference with staff and we only have 18 staff at the Museums Association and I know some of those staff had campaigned to remain and I know some of those staff had voted to leave. So when we saw the results of the referendum, I was scraping some members of staff off the floor because they were so devastated with the results and also defending other members of staff who'd voted in a different way. And that just really sharply struck me that that happened in communities up and down the UK. And I think if we don't see the humanity in the people that think differently to us on some of those broader issues in society, we can't have a conversation. And I think we do have to have the conversation. I think there are some red line issues that we don't invite the conversation into our spaces. But on those other issues, I think we need to, if we're going to function as organisations that are connected to communities and engage with our communities, we need to function in that space and have the conversation. Okay. Okay. There's a question just on the left side here, please. If you'd put your hands up again, then thank you, she'll find you. Thank you. Um, I asked this question or I make this comment to somebody who was nearly in tears at the end of the last presentation just because of the sincerity and sort of a way of living that I was getting from that. But I also asked this question as somebody who was born in the UK to Irish parents. I, I, we were brought, I was brought back when I was 11. Um, I was brought up during the Troubles where we didn't, where I went to Northern Ireland perhaps twice between, um, before I was 50 something. Because I lived in Canada for about 15 years of my life, I left at the end of the 80s. And the one difficulty I have in what I've heard is the use of the word enemies. And we're here in Belfast at this conference, talking about dissent, etc but also with Brexit and everything, we're worried because we have learned to talk to one another and appreciate one another's perspective. So I very much almost switch the radio off every time I hear OCO's voice 
Um, it's very difficult living in the world that we're living in now. But nevertheless, I do feel I have to say that one of the reasons for the, that I think that the theme of this conference is what it is, is because of the learning to talk to one another that has happened. And while it's not perfect, and one of the reasons there's so much worry about the border is because there's still that residual underlining, but we've learned to try to be civil to one another. <laughs> so that's why I just find that word enemy very difficult because people were sworn enemies. And one of the presentations that happened yesterday was talking about sort of the decade of commemorations and we in the South and the North are coming up to the more difficult ones, especially in the South, where we had a civil war where brother fought against brother. So that's just the comment I'm making. Okay. And I think that speaks very much Elaine, to Elaine's um, response to the first question about establishing those rules of engagement, which seem to have been established and, and then ripped apart essentially by some politicians who have um, dismantled what we would call civility and normal rules of engagement. We're just running out of time, so I'm just going to ask each of the panel for, amongst all of the things that we can do, amongst all of the cohorts, the networks, the mentors, etc., what is your one tip to ensure that you can stay the course whilst you are leading with your values in socially engaged practice? Sharon, I'm going to be naughty and come to you first. I would say find allies find good strong allies and go back to them it's a bit like going back to your family and friends find the people who you know will support you and and make them into a network well i would take on from small steps that we heard i mean uh, not to think on ideal results of uh, of our strategies but uh, don't give up uh, make small steps from your own desk. You don't need to be in the battlefield. And uh, when, there are, when there are cases such as the ones that Elaine mentioned in which it's very hard to think on, on talking and carrying on a conversation with a predator, like the ones is happening now in Brazil, I don't know how to react when someone says that women are inferior, that black people are no good. I mean, how can you start a conversation with such a person who's the head of state of a wonderful country? Uh, I, I don't yet know. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the, the, it is already very, very bad and, and difficult to start it. But I think one has to take small steps, do alliances with those who can think differently and, uh, and little by little, I think, I mean, I have immense hope and optimism, as Elaine mentions, as to, as to being able to take out that joy which we would never have to resign. Um, like yourself. You're, you're good people. Look in the mirror and say, you know, I can do that. Here's what I need. But at the same time, always interrogate yourself. It's never fixed. There's always stuff to learn. Okay. So on that we close. Find allies, take small steps, look in the mirror and like yourself. Thank you very much to our panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you.